Good morning, my brothers and sisters at Aerosmith Baptist Church. I pray that you are doing well and that God has blessed you and has kept you in these days as we continue to look to God and lean into God and learn from God in this season of chaos. I suspect some of you are tired of being stuck at home. Most people I've talked to is just to say that they are uh, missing for us to be all together. And that is the way it should be. Uh, God created us for relationships, relationship with him, and then a relationship with each other. And we read, read of that in Psalm 42, when the psalmist writes, As the deer longs for streams of water, so I long for you, O God. I thirst for God, the living God. When can I go and stand before him? Day and night I have only tears for food, while my enemies continually taunt me, saying, Where is this God of yours? My heart is breaking as I remember how it used to be. I walked among the crowds of worshipers, leading a great procession to the house of God, singing for joy and giving thanks amid the sound of a great celebration. Why am I discouraged? Why is my heart so sad? I will put my hope in God. I will praise him again, my Savior and my God. So brothers and sisters, in the midst of uh, separation, uh, we can know that when we worship God, we are worshiping together and we will worship together physically someday again. This coming week, our leadership team is going to have its first uh, Zoom uh, meeting. And in the next few weeks, we'll have that uh, ready for you also to be involved in Bible studies and fellowship and prayer. And speaking of prayer, there is now a prayer request button on the front page of our website. And you just click the button and an email window will come up with my email address and just simply write your prayer request and send it out. Also re regarding prayer, uh, please consider joining us in fasting and prayer on Good Friday, April 10th, to specifically focus on seeking God's will and seeking God's power and seeking God's presence in the midst of the times that we live in. So we need to pray by ourselves. We need to pray with our families. We need to pray with those in the church by phone or by other kind of media. But just we need to pray that God would use a, this, these things in these days to be a spark for the revival of those hearts and lives and the people that we know that don't know Jesus. And we should um, also think ahead. Uh, next week, we have Easter coming up, Resurrection Sunday. And we've gotten a few ideas given to us about how we might gather together on Sunday morning and specifically talking about doing that in the parking lot for worship. But the truth is, I'm, I'm not sure that would be a very good witness uh, to the community. We should abide to the mandate that our earthly authorities have uh, put before us regarding numbers and distance. And I again would encourage all of us to meet together through our phones and through our technology until uh, things get better. I also want to remind you if you have a need or know someone who has a need, please let us know. A uh, reminder also about offerings. You've been very faithful. You can give online on our church website, or you can bring it to the office on Tuesday between 9 and 2, or you can drop it through the mail slot on the side door of the church anytime. Uh, this morning, we will also be taking the Lord's Supper together, and it will be after the message. And after the message, I will give you some time specifically, or to be exact, four minutes of time to gather together your bread and your cup and whatever you decided to put in your cup. And then I will lead you through communion. So would you please join me in prayer? Heavenly Father, we, we bless you this day that you are a sovereign God who rules and reigns over our lives and over the world, and over your creation, and over all the universe. And we come before you this morning confessing our, our deep and desperate need for you. 
And Lord God, we gather together today to, to give you our worship. We, we glory in the reality that you have loved us and forgiven us and saved us through the life and death and resurrection of your Son, Jesus Christ. And on this day, we beg your help. We beg your Holy Spirit that we would be instruments of grace in a world that is in disarray. And may our time today with you as we worship change us and empower us to follow you ever deeper into the kingdom of God so that Jesus might be praised forever. And it's in his name we pray.
Father, we praise you and bless you, Lord, that you are our good Heavenly Father, Lord. That at this time, we can come to you, Lord, and you will hear us and answer us, Lord. We can trust you and trust your word. Lord, even though we are separate physically right now, we thank you that we are still one body united by your spirit, Lord, under the headship of Jesus Christ. And we can have common union in that, Lord. We thank you. We thank you for this technology that enables us to fellowship and worship together corporately, even though we are separate at this time. Lord, There are many anxieties and worries at this time that we are probably all struggling with, Lord. And Lord, you promised you are the, the God of all comfort. And we come to you, Lord, and look to you for comfort and peace. Lord, we pray for those who are struggling in health. Lord, we pray for healing and we pray for again your comfort at this time and that um, Lord there would be uh, pr protection from um, the spread of, of this virus Lord uh, that you would just keep a hedge of protection um, around our church and families and workplaces and our community, Lord. Lord, we pray for those who are perhaps struggling financially right now, Lord, and an uncertain future. Lord, we know you are the God who provides, and Lord, we just ask that you would provide and give help to those who need it, Lord, and that we can trust and hope in you, Lord. And as much as we are able to help us to help those around us, Lord, give us eyes to see that uh, the needs that are around us and to help as much as we can. Lord, we just thank you for this opportunity to gather in your name and we join with all those in our fellowship. We join with those in the Alberni Valley who are meeting in your name this morning. And for those on Vancouver Island, in Canada, and all over the world, Lord, who are meeting to worship you in their homes and to hear from your word, Lord. And we pray that your word would go forth uh, boldly this morning, Lord, and that hearts would be changed. Lord, that we would uh, just show your love to our brothers and sisters and to our neighbors, Lord, that you would be honored and glorified in this place and all around the world. We thank you, Lord. We praise you that you are a good God and that you have a plan and a purpose for all that you're doing, Lord. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. The message this morning will be from Psalm 23. I invite you to turn there in your Bibles. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. 
He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for you are with me. Your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil, my cup overflows. Surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. May the Lord bless his word. The 23rd Psalm is undoubtedly the most well-known psalm in the entire Bible, probably the most well-known passage in the entire Bible. Of all the psalms in the Bible, probably this one is the most loved and probably the most memorized. Uh, it has been called a poem with, without peer and the sweetest song ever sung. And in the same way, I could compare it to John Newton's Amazing Grace where it seems like people who have no clue of what the Christian faith is about embrace that song in the same way many people who have no Christian faith at all know the 23rd Psalm. We love this song. We love it because it's personal, because it's individual. It uh, speaks tenderly to us about our God. We read it at funerals to comfort the sorrowing. We read it at hospital beds to encourage the suffering. We read it to those who are hurting, who have been pummeled by the discouragements of life. We read it and we love it because it is a psalm that gives us confidence, confidence in God. Psalm 23 is called the Shepherd Psalm because it portrays God as our great shepherd, the shepherd who cares for us and looks after his flock. King David wrote this psalm, and if there's anybody qualified to do so, King David was. He was a shepherd for quite some time before he was called to be king. And how often he must have gazed up into the heavens at night, uh, watching out over his flock, and thought at this very same time about the nature and the heart of God. Years of shepherding had taught him that God is our great shepherd. And he shares those things with us today. Now, unfortunately, we live in a society where few of us truly know what it means to shepherd sheep. Um, I doubt if any of us has probably even done that at all. I have some kind of close association. I was a herdsman of a, host, a herd of Holsteins for quite a while, and on our farm we had uh, a smaller herd of dairy goats. But, but goats are goats, and cows are cows, and sheep are different than that. And the Bible says we're more like sheep. So I have a sense of it, but not a full sense. But uh, this psalm is familiar to us, and it's, it's set in the knowledge of that there are sheep and shepherds. And so we have to really look at that context of sheep and shepherds, or we'll miss the true meaning that God has for us here. The, the richness and significance that's here could slide right by us if we don't pay attention to the fact that this is a shepherd writing about God the shepherd, and we are the sheep. Of course, Jesus, we know today for us, is the good shepherd, and the sheep are Christians, the church. And so in the 23rd Psalm, we read, first of all, three affirmations of how God is our shepherd, and we are his people. First, we see that God's shepherd heart in that he, he gives us, he provides for us. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures, he leads me beside still waters, he restores my soul, he leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. In these words, we see four ways in which God shepherds his people through providing for them. First, our God, our shepherd, he provides contentment. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. What this means is if, if God is truly our shepherd, that we don't lack anything that is good and necessary. There's a story of a Sunday school teacher who asked his class, how many of you know the 23rd Psalm? And most of them raised their hand, and he was surprised that a little four-year-old girl raised her hand too. And so he asked her to recite it. And she stood up and said, the Lord is my shepherd, that's all I want. 
Now, the words might be mixed up, but the little girl's heart is not mixed up. That's exactly what that means. What it means is, if Jesus is our shepherd, everything else is secondary. Everything. We could say it this way, if the Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. But, if I am in want, then I'm not letting the Lord be my shepherd. In Psalm 39, we read that when we fear the Lord, we have no lack. When we honor and awe, stand in awe of God, we have no lack. So when God is our shepherd, we are taken care of. We are taken care of. The truth is, most of our wants, though, find their source in our desires rather than our needs. True contentment is not meaning getting everything you want. True contentment is wanting everything you already have in God. When someone says, I shall not want, we need to sit up and take notice because we live in a culture of discontentment. Jason Lehman wrote it this way. He said, it was spring, but it was summer I wanted, the warm days and the great outdoors. It was summer, but it was fall I wanted, the colorful leaves and the cool, dry air. It was fall, but winter I wanted, the beautiful snow and the joy of the holiday seasons. It was winter, but it was spring I wanted, the warmth and the blossoming of nature. I was a child, but adulthood I wanted, the freedom and the respect. I was 20, but 30 I wanted, the youth and the free spirit, excuse me, to be mature and sophisticated. Then, when I was middle-aged, I wanted 20 again, the youth and the free spirit, then I became retired, and it was middle age I wanted, the presence of mind without limitations. And then my life was over, and I never got what I wanted. There's a cemetery in England with a gravestone that reads, she died for want of things. There's a stone right alongside of it which says, he died trying to give it to her. The age of discontentment we live in today has put us into a prison of want. Many today are prisoners of always wanting something bigger or faster or nicer or thinner. If your happiness comes from what you deposit, what you drive, what you drink or digest, then you are in a prison of want. If you're hoping for a change of circumstance that will bring you happiness, then you're in a prison of discontentment. The power, the power of the Lord is my shepherd I shall not want, comes from the reality that what we have in the shepherd is greater than anything we do not have or we even do have. God provides contentment, nothing else. Secondly, our shepherd, good shepherd, provides nourishment. He, he makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside still waters. Notice that the shepherd makes us, makes us lie down. Josephus, the early first century scholar, wrote that sometimes the shepherd would institute forced periods of rest for his sheep, especially for pregnant ewes and baby lambs. And the shepherd would take a sheep and fold their legs in such a way that they would become somewhat paralyzed for a while and therefore had to lie down and get much needed rest. Now, that's true for us today, too. Some of us have to lie down. God makes us lie down because of a physical, emotional, or spiritual issue. Know that when that happens, God is making you lie down because we need a time of rest. Shepherds make their sheep, sometimes force them to rest and lie down. Now we know from shepherds that there's only four conditions that can happen for that rest to happen. Shepherd, excuse me, sheep rest Number one, when they have freedom from fear. Because by nature, sheep are nervous and fearful. When they want to know the shepherd and they want rest, they go to him, and that's when they relax. In Isaiah 43, 5, God says, Fear not, for I am with you. So when the sheep know the shepherd is there, they can rest. We are at rest when we are free from fear. Sheep also rest when they are freedom from friction. Friction, when there's friction in the flock, the sheep cannot sleep. So instead of lying down, they end up standing up and pushing each other around. 
So the shepherd minimizes the tension by making them lie down. We're at rest and we're free from friction. Sheep also rest when they're freedom from frustrations. I don't know if you know much about animals outside, but there's lots of gnats and flies and parasites that are always flying around them. Sheep are distracted and can't rest when that's happening. So shepherds have ways in order to help them. When we're free from frustration, we can have rest. Lastly, sheep rest when they're free from famine. A hungry sheep is forever on its feet, looking around, looking for food. But the shepherd is sure that they will be in places where there are green pastures where they can feed among the rich, sweet grass. They are rest when they're well fed. But some of us sheep, this is us, never slow down. We never slow down long enough to chew well and to eat at green pastures. We're kind of a fast food folk. We're either filled with fear or we're in friction with other sheep or we're allowing small frustrations to knock us off center. We're not able then to eat and digest the richness and the sweetness of the word that God has given us. God wants us to lay down in the midst of the busyness of life and chew in the abundance of truth he gives us. A sheep that's lying down in the meadows has no worries because the master is there. And this is good news for us in a society that is full of anxiety and discontentment and unrest. Studies tell us as many as 25% of us do not get enough sleep because of stress and anxiety. But the richness of the Word of God, Philippians 4, 6, tells us, do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, in prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God, who is our shepherd. So after being fully fed, sheep are then quietly watered. He leads them beside still waters. Sheep, by nature, are afraid of moving water. They refuse to drink unless things are still and quiet. So shepherds would often divert waters that were rushing off to a pool and so they could come around it and drink quietly. But even with quiet waters, sometimes the shepherd has to lead the sheep to those quiet waters because otherwise sheep will often wander off and drink out of polluted pools to the side. We're pretty much the same way. If we don't follow the lead and drink from the things that God has for us, we will drink things that will not be good for us. God provides pure quiet water, but often we drink of things and even eat of things that are not good for us. In his book, Traveling Light, Max Lucado put it this way. With his own pierced hands, Jesus created a pasture for our souls. He tore out the thorny underbrush of condemnation. He pried loose the boulders of sin. In their place, he planted seeds of grace and dug deep ponds of pure mercy. Thirdly, our God, our shepherd, provides restoration. He restores my soul. Because sheep are careless and curious and cantankerous creatures, they often need to be restored. Sounds a bit like us too. The word restore here means to bring back to a former state as we use it in English. Sheep are naturally prone to independence and wandering, so they seem to be getting lost a lot easier than most animals. As a result, they often fall down and get hurt or get attacked by a predator, or they may simply tip over. Some of you may have heard this before. They will tip over and do what is called being cast down. This is a term used for a sheep that's lying on its back with its feet flailing in the air. Often sheep are either too fat or they have too much wool. and They'll lie down and they'll fall into a little depression and then they're stuck because their center of gravity shifts and they're finally just laying there with their feet in the air. When sheep are missing, the shepherd will go look for those who are cast down because buzzards and vultures and coyotes know that cast down are easy meat. When the shepherd finds the sheep, he rolls it over, lifts it to his feet, straddles the sheep, rubs the muscles, quietly speaks to it until it gets its gravity, and then he lets it go. 
there's a picture of our God. When we constantly keep rolling on our backs because we're either too fat or have too much full, He comes alongside of us. He picks us up. He puts us back on our feet. He speaks to us. He cares for us. Fourthly, our God, our shepherd, will also provide guidance. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his namesake. The word paths here in the original language means a well-defined and well-worn path. Here's more evidence how stupid sheep can be. Even when the path is perfectly clear, they will stray off into another direction. Since sheep, since, excuse me, since shepherds know the trails, he's the one that can guide them in the best way. God leads them in us in paths of righteousness. Most of us know the right road to take, but because we are like sheep, we will often wander off that path too. We need a shepherd, just like sheep do, to lead us down the right path. As we submit to the shepherd, he will lead us into righteousness. He will do so for not our sake, but for his, for his glory. God guides us for himself even more than us because his reputation is at stake, not ours. His purposes can be accomplished when we are on the right path. So we can see God is our shepherd in his provision of contentment, of nourishment, of restoration, and of guidance. Secondly, we see God's heart for his people and not only just provision, but also in his protection. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. For your rod and your staff, they comfort me. You prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. You anoint my head with oil. God's shepherd heart can be seen in the first three verses, in his provision, verses 1 through 3. But now we come to verse 4, and a shift happens here, a dramatic shift. In verses 1 through 3, the sheep are in the sunshine. They're being watered, they're being rested. In verse 4, we now step into the shadows. God not only takes care of us in providing contentment and nourishment, restoration and guidance, but he also guides us through the dark seasons of life. Notice the pronouns change here. In the first half, these first three verses, David praises the virtues of the shepherd using he and his to refer to God. Now when we come to this second part, he speaks to the shepherd much more directly. You are with me. Your rod and your staff. You prepare. You anoint. When times get tough, seems like God gets more personal, doesn't it? It does for all of us. It seems like true intimacy with God can only come through hardship and suffering and struggle. It's during times of deep pain and despair and gloom, we can often see then finally God's heart to protect us. It's then we realize that God is still with us because that's His protection, His presence. His presence is His protection. God's Word tells us, There's three things that we need not fear when we are in the green pastures but then move into the shadows of death. Because God is with us, we need not fear death. Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil for you are with me. The picture here is the shepherd leading his sheep down back home in the evening. They go through some rocky ravines, some narrow gorges, some long Shadows begin to creep across and dance across the trail, frightening the flock because in those areas the shepherd knows that there are bears and wolves and lions waiting to get an easy meal. Notice that they walk through the valley. Brothers and sisters, we don't have to stay in any, in any valley. Not with God we don't. We don't have to stay in any valley. When we are truly following Jesus, we are just passing through just passing through valleys. Because in Christ, there's a brightness beyond the darkness. There's a glory beyond the gloom. David continues, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. The rod, spoken of here, is a club that used to hang on a shepherd's belt. It was used to protect the sheep when shepherds were very adept with their aim and they could throw and hit that, uh, it's kind of like a hammer, a strong, big hammer. 
and uh, they were able to hit attacking animals with it. The staff itself is what we normally see, this long slender pole with a little crook on the end of it. It was used to defend the sheep, but it was also used at times to take that little crook and pull the sheep back into an area of protection when they wouldn't move on their own. Notice here that sheep are not the ones carrying the rods and the staffs. It's the shepherd. Sheep must rely on the shepherd for protection and for direction and for safety and for discipline. When sheep could see the rod and the staff, they knew they were protected. They could walk through dark valleys because the shepherd was with them. Jesus said what? I am with you always, even to the end of the age. Secondly, because God is with us, we need not fear danger. David writes, you prepare a table before me in the presence of my enemies. Well, it's been suggested at times and through some uh, interpretations that David is switching metaphors here from sheep and shepherd into uh, a gracious host with a dinner, you know, having a dinner with people. I'm not willing to stray away from that because I don't think the Bible does. We're still talking shepherd and sheep. So a closer look gives us a picture, I think, that, that David would have used because the ideal place in Israel to graze sheep were on the top of a flat mesa, a, a table-like piece of land on the top of ground. Common expression among shepherds of Jesus' day was preparing the pasture for the sheep, which meant before you let the sheep go free, the shepherds would go into the table-like pasture and they would walk through and make sure there was no poisonous plants or that there would not be any animals there that were ready to attack the sheep. Once that was prepared, they would let the sheep come into that table. The sheep could eat and rest because there are no enemies there, whether it be of food or of animals. And the presence of the, presence of the shepherd kept them, kept them safe. So here's what we have in God. God does the same things for us. The presence of God as our shepherd does the same. He goes before us and he sovereignly prepares the pasture for us ahead of time wherever we go in life. What that means is everything that happens to us in any place at any time has already been prepared by God for us to go into. The greatest pain, the greatest struggle, the greatest anguish of our lives has still been prepared by God. He is with us. and He's prepared that place before we even got there. Acts 17, 20, 20, 28 tells us that in Him we live and move and have our being. Colossians 1.17 tells us, Jesus is before all things, and in him all things hold together. It's the same picture. We should never fear danger, brothers and sisters, because God is with us. And because God is with us, thirdly, we need not fear any difficulty either. You anoint my head with oil, David writes. In David's day, a generous host would anoint the foreheads or even the heads of his guests with expensive and fragrant oil. This would help neutralize body odor and the smells that cling to everyday life. Now, in our culture today of tolerance and pol political correctness, I'm not sure that would go well. It would be like when people come to your house, you give them each a stick of deodorant as they walked in the door. But in David's day, this was a good thing. They saw it as, as a gift, as an opportunity to share joy because it was much more of a fragrant culture in a bad way than ours is today. To be anointed with oil was considered to be splashed with joy is the phrase they would use. While that may shed some light on the meaning of this text, I think still we still need to stay in the shepherd-sheep relationship. Because in ancient Israel, shepherds used oil for three different purposes. It has nothing to do with deodorant. One purpose for oil was the covering to repel insects. Okay? Sheep have a real problem with bugs. And especially in the flies that like to deposit their eggs into the tender membrane of their noses. While the eggs would hatch, the sheep would, for hours, 
to bang their heads against things and shake their head. And remember, they would fall over easy. This wouldn't help. Okay. So what shepherds used to do is just coat the insides of their nasal membranes with oil to keep the larvae from forming again. Another use was to prevent conflict. Often the rams would injure themselves during certain times of the year by fighting back and forth. And when that began to happen, whenever a shepherd heard two rams say to a female sheep, I want you, babe. Think about it, you. He knew there'd be trouble. (laughs) So the shepherd would quickly grab a bunch of oil and smear it on the heads of both rams. So they would hit, but not tear, but they would slide off each other. Another use that a shepherd used was oil was for wounds, to heal wounds. Sheep and flocks get lots of wounds and cuts simply because they are in a pasture. You've got lots of thorns, lots of sharp rocks. And so oil served as an ointment to protect them from getting infection. So here's a picture we have, again, of God being our shepherd. He deals with our difficulties by protecting us from things that can hurt us. He helps us to have harmony with each other. He comforts us and heals us when we're hurting and beat up. And as sinners who live in a a sinful, fallen world, we are wounded sheep, and we often need the healing of our shepherd. Jesus Christ is the good shepherd, he tells us. He is our great physician. He is our savior. He is with us. He is our protection. Third and lastly, we see God's shepherd heart for his people, and that just he has, provides for us and protects us, but he also has promises for us too. My cup overflows, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life, and I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. Because of God's protection, we need not fear death, danger, or difficulties. Instead, we can focus on and embrace his promises. We read of two ways that we see God's shepherd heart in his promises to his people. That first of all, God has promised to bless us when mo- with more than we presently need. My cup overflows, surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. Now there are two possible meanings to my cup overflows. The, the first meaning comes from the culture of hospitality in the Middle East where dinner hosts would serve, fill the cups of those who are are visiting. Now, filling a cup was a common way to tell your guests that you could stay as long as you wanted to. When the host really enjoyed the company of a person, they kept filling the cup over and over to overflowing. They just kept pouring and pouring until the liquid ran over the edge of the cup. That was just a sign. I really like to have you here. I'm not sure how wives would have liked that, but you're pouring things all over the place. But when a cup sat empty, the host was hinting it was time to leave. The other meaning, again, which I think is more proper in the context of the shepherd and the sheep, comes from the fact that shepherds often carried water, not only for themselves, but also for those sheep that needed it in extreme circumstances when they were thirsty. This seems to fit the context here of surely goodness and mercy shall follow me all the days of my life. John 4, 10 through 14 tells us in the midst of our spiritual thirst, Jesus is our living water. In Christ, God's goodness and his loving kindness, his faithfulness is with us. The word follow here means to literally pursue. God pursues us with his mercy and his goodness. This is the the water that we need. The word mercy here is actually one of the most important words in the Bible. I've talked about it before, but it's it's chesed, which is the idea of God's loving covenantal love, his promise to us regardless of whatever we do, that he has called us and chosen us and he will protect us. The word normally is translated loving kindness or steadfast love, but translators use mercy here to point out another essential aspect of God's loving kindness. Because if God only gave us justice, we all would be condemned and punished 
for our disobedient wandering. But in Jesus Christ, God has faithfully fulfilled His promise to love us with His mercy. Kesed is a faithful promise of God, of a loving God to His people, God's goodness and God's mercy. That is what ultimately led Jesus to the cross is where our mercy comes from. On the cross is where our shepherd gave his life for his sheep. In drinking the cup of death, Jesus lovingly poured out the overflow of God's love into our lives, the goodness and the mercy for us needy sheep people. But God's kessed, his mercy, even goes beyond that. His blessings go far beyond just what we need. Everyone in this room, probably everyone that we even know of, has much more than they need. God gives us much more, promises much more than we need. But God has also promised He will bless us much more than we will need in the future. And I shall dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Christ, we have more than we need right now, and we'll have everything someday in eternity. The psalm began, The Lord is my shepherd closes with, I will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. The sheep have been following the shepherd to green pastures and then to shadowy valleys. And now the seasons have changed. And now the sheep are coming home. And the flock is now ready to joyfully winter in the arms of the good shepherd's eternally green pastures. That is our good shepherd. A famous actor once with, with, a, with a wonderful voice was once asked by an old preacher to recite the, 20, recite the 23rd Psalm during a meeting in the church. And the actor agreed on the condition that the preacher would recite the psalm also afterwards. And so the actor stood up in his Shakespearean way and he gave a dramatic presentation of the 23rd Psalm with wonderful intonation and modulation. And everyone stood to their feet when they was, he was done, and they, they clapped and applauded wildly. And the pastor then stood up in a very rough voice, broken from years of preaching and pastoring, quoted the 23rd Psalm from memory. When he was finished, no one stood. No one applauded. Instead, everyone sat quietly, shedding tears. When asked the reason for the difference, the actor said, well, while I knew the words of the 23rd Psalm, the pastor knew the shepherd. Do you know the 23rd Psalm today or do you know the shepherd? Jesus said, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me. Just as the Father knows me and I know the Father, I lay down my life for my sheep. Jesus spoke to those who knew know him when he said to him the gatekeeper opens the sheep hear his voice and he calls his own sheep by name and leads them out when he has brought out all his own he goes before them and the sheep follow him for they know his voice Jesus is the shepherd who calls us to follow him if anyone would come after me let him follow me take up his cross daily he said so when you intimately know the shepherd you want to stay close to Him. You, you want to follow His voice. At times it will be through green pastures, and at other times it will be through dark valleys. But, but either way, the shepherd is always with us. He has a plan. He has a purpose for each one of our lives, for our church. He has, for all of history, He has a plan and purpose. And He wants to lead us all, lead us all together in paths of righteousness for our good, for His namesake, His glory. One thing happens when you read this psalm that you can only read so far with your eyes and with your mind and with your mouth before you begin to speak to God from your heart. Because the theology of He leads me turns personal into you are with me. He both leads us and He is with us. And it's often true that the 23rd Psalm comes up during tough times. And that's when we're drawn to the shepherd. But that's also true for all of us. Okay. We, are, we are God's people. We are His sheep. 
He is our shepherd. And when Jesus came into the world, he was called Emmanuel, which means God with us. Not just me, but us. So may we each, and may we all together, live out the reality that God is our shepherd, and he is with us. I close with um, the words from Hebrews 13, 20 through 21. It says, Now may the God of peace who brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, the great shepherd of the sheep, by the blood of the eternal covenant, equip you with everything good that you may do his will, working in us that which is pleasing in his sight through Jesus Christ to whom be glory forever and ever. And then it says, Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we praise you that you are our good and faithful shepherd and that you are all that we need in life. We bless you that in the midst of the fear and chaos of our fallen world, you provide rest and peace and restoration for our minds and for our hearts and our bodies and our souls. Help us in these days to hear the grace of your voice and to see the glory of your face. As we walk through the days before us, we praise you for the promise of your presence and your power in the face of threats of fear and death. We thank you that you lead us and walk with us in the form of the risen Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior. It is in him and through him that your goodness and your mercy will follow us all the days of our lives. By his sacrifice on the bloody cross, we will dwell in the house of the Lord forever. In Jesus' name, all God's people said, Amen. So now it's time for us to prepare for taking our the Lord's Supper together. And so I would ask you at this time to go and bring your bread and your cup together and a song will be played as you do so.
fire, but all through the blood. Some through great sorrow, but God gives a song. In the night season, and all the day We at Aerosmith Baptist Church believe that the Lord's Supper proclaims the reality that Jesus' death on a cross in our place paid the penalty for our sins so that we might be forgiven and redeemed and restored back to God. So we might then be given a new life here on earth and then an eternal life in the glory of heaven forever. God's Word tells us that we are to do this in remembrance of Jesus' death when his body was broken for us on a cross and his blood was shed for our sins. Jesus instituted this ordinance with his disciples on the night before he was crucified. When we break the bread, we remember how his body was broken for us. When we drink of the cup, we remember how he shed his blood for our sakes so we might be forgiven. We take the Lord's Supper not in order to receive God's forgiveness, but because we already have gotten, received from Jesus forgiveness for our sins. The Bible also tells us that whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord in an unworthy manner will be guilty before God concerning the body and blood of Christ. And so we are to take some time to examine ourselves and open our hearts to God before we eat of the bread and drink of the cup. And let's do that now. In God's word, the Apostle Paul writes, For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus on the night when he was betrayed took bread, and when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Let's pray for the bread. Lord Jesus, as we take this bread, we remember that you are the bread of life. You feed our souls, you nourish our hearts, and you give us the power and strength to believe in you and to follow you. As we break this bread, we remember your body was broken for our sins. As we eat this bread, we are reminded of the provision of grace for our forgiveness. As we swallow this bread, we know that it gives us nourishment for life just as you have given your life so we might have a new life in you today and forever. We thank you with all of our hearts for the price that you paid when you were crucified on the cross for us. We thank you that too, just as yeast and bread causes it to rise, you rose from death as our Savior, Lord Jesus, King forever. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. We may now pass the bread to one another and just wait and we will take it all together.
remembering the broken body of our Lord Jesus that was broken for our sins. In the same way also he took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. For as often as you eat this bread and drink the cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Let's pray for the cup. Lord Jesus, as we drink this cup, we remember that you are the giver of life. You are our forgiveness. You bring peace into our souls and your love flows within us. As we pour out this cup, we see your sacrifice poured out for us. We embrace, Lord, the depth of your goodness to us. And we feel the pain, the suffering for us. We see your blood flow cleansing the depravity out of our hearts, anointing us with your mercy and your grace. We praise you, Lord Jesus. As the tombstone rolled away to unleash the risen Lord, your light now shines in our hearts, destroying the darkness, releasing the blessings of the kingdom of God upon us. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now it's time to pass the cup, gather together, and we will take it together in a few moments. Remembering the shed blood of our Lord Jesus that was shed for our sins. please join me in prayer our Father who art in heaven hallowed be thy name thy kingdom come thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us and lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil for thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. And all God's people said, Amen.
came to rise to show his power and might. That's why we praise him. That's why we sing. That's why we offer him our everything. That's why we bow down and worship this king. Cause he gave his everything. Cause he gave his everything. He came to live. God's blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you his peace. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit, all God's people said, Amen.